big camp schedule rather than your summer I don't have to do anything schedule. Hope that's going well. Uh, make sure that if you have not done so already that you contact your family to let them know that you're like doing okay today. Uh, a lot of them dropped you up yesterday and then probably uh, want to know that you are still uh, doing okay today. So uh, lunchtime, send a little text, be like, hey, have fun, or you know, not. But tell them, tell them you're alive, tell them you're okay, uh, and then they won't worry. Um, that's not good. Okay, um, so what I want, um, if you, I have put on the board <coughs> sort of a general outline, um, but if you are a computer notes taker, um, I have also put up um, an outline of the notes um, for you to download and fill in. Um, and that is available on the Google site. Everybody should know where uh, the Google site is. Go to like sites.google.com slash site slash Georgetown Debate Seminar. Over on the left hand side of that Google site um, is a link called Lectures. And if you click the Lectures thing, uh, you can download uh, the lecture notes outline. If you were planning on taking notes on paper, please just do that. The paper notes are like one million times better uh, than computer notes. Happy to provide uh, studies on that, but you remember them better. So, but if you are already a computer notes person and cannot be converted, uh, there is a lecture notes outline um, for your proposal. So, um, at the top of those that lecture notes outline, I included two quotations that I think sort of frame the conversation that we will be having today. The first quotation is from the chair of the UN Committee on the Protection of the Rights of Migrant Workers. And uh, he says, migration is a defining human rights issue of our time. Therefore, it is critical that we address it at every turn. Migration, the fighting human rights issue of our time, it is critical that we address it at every turn. The second quotation uh, is from a senior editor at The Atlantic, uh, and he says, immigration seems to be the most prominent wedge issue in America. So that's in an article talking about um, the sort of issues that divide the country right now, um, and he identifies immigration as the number one dividing issue um, in uh, American politics today, which about all of the uh, plethora of dividing issues. Uh, to say that immigration is the dividing issue um, is, is a pretty bold statement. So up at the top um, of the document is the resolution wording. So this year uh, we are debating about immigration broadly, but we are in particular debating whether the United States federal government should substantially reduce its restrictions on legal immigration to the United States. And you'll be breaking that down a bunch in lab um, so we're not going to do a ton of talking about the details of topic wording today. Instead, my goal is to give you the background information that you need in order to be able to read about immigration policy and have conversations about what the topic means, what the affirmative arguments are, look at packet evidence and be able to sort of understand what's going on. So um, today gives you background information that will allow you um, to then participate in lab conversations um, about immigration and the immigration topic. So first I wanted to sort of, um, sort of give you the lay of the land um, on the immigration topic. So what I mean by that um, is that uh, some of you might not know this, but high school topics are voted on nationally. There's a, there's a committee that comes up with topics. There's a big list of topics, about seven. That gets narrowed down to two topics. Um, and schools across the country vote for what they want their high school students to be debating. Um, so last year, you know, uh, all the high school teachers got together. They voted we should be debating about education. This year, some of your coaches may have voted, um, and they determined that you all should be debating about immigration, that of all the things that uh, hundreds and thousands of high school students across America can be debating, immigration is the thing. Um, and uh, the last vote was between two topics, it was between immigration and poverty, both clearly important issues. Um, and so I sort of wanted to start with, why do you think that a bunch of high school teachers got together um, and decided that the thing that their students should most be learning about right now, the pressing issue, uh, is immigration. Why do you think we, we chose immigration as a, as a topic to debate? Who's got some, some thoughts on why, why we would have a topic about immigration, why we would debate immigration? Yeah, what do you got? Because as the quote said, it's the biggest dividing issue in American politics. Yeah, so um, tell, tell me more about that. Do you have like do people in your family maybe talk about immigration as an issue? Do you know I like mean, that's in your community? My grandparents are immigrants themselves, so it's kind of like something that I learned from them. Yeah, so in your family probably there's some people who are immigrants, there's some people who aren't immigrants, it's a conversation. You know, you have learned a lot about their their process and how, how they came to America. Absolutely. Why else are we debating about immigration? <coughs> Yeah, so if any of you uh, just like even really lightly peruse the media, like you don't have to be a, a big 
media consumer, um, news consumer, to realize that this is something that is huge in America right now. Like we're debating about separating families at the border. We're debating about how to deal with detention facilities. We're debating about deportations. Absolutely, and that's all going to be um, discussed. Wow. Well, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a lot of times the best debate topics are timely, right? As you two identified, they are things that are being debated right now, but they're also sort of perpetual issues. And as we're going to see in just a second, um, how to deal with the question of like who comes to a particular country is something that America has been dealing with for centuries, um, sometimes better than other times. Um, and I think that that's, that's absolutely true, that it's, it's sort of an eternal issue. Um, any other thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, so this concept of like the wedge issue, and we'll, you'll be looking at more over time and more when you get into the packet evidence, but um, this is a really important issue for voters, it's a really important issue for political parties. Politicians recently have been sort of changing some of their perspectives on this, different parties have been realigning on the issue of immigration, so yeah, absolutely. And then the other thing uh, that I just sort of wanted to highlight um, is that this topic asks the affirmative uh, to reduce restrictions on legal immigration. And right now, the Trump administration is sort of moving in the other direction. And so a lot of times, better topics um, move away from the way that the current situation is going. So it's not just more of the same. It's we should do something different. And this topic asks us um, on the affirmative to take a different perspective on immigration. And you'll talk more about that in lab. All right. An extremely brief history of immigration in the United States. So uh, the initial wave of immigration to the United States um, from the 1400s to 1800 um, is the uh, original colonization of the Americas by people from Europe. So all the way from you know Columbus's arrival and uh, the Vikings and all sorts of things that you probably learned in your early American history class. Um, that's sort of the first wave of immigration, I think. A lot of people who are talking about immigration now sometimes forget that that first wave of immigration was really a form of colonization. And so that's something to sort of keep in mind um, when you were talking about you know, who should be allowed to come in and not come in now, um, that you know, uh, most people uh, descend, at least in part, um, from that initial wave of colonization. Then, of course, uh, from the 1500s to uh, about 1807 uh, was the Atlantic slave trade. Um, that's not a form of legal immigration in the sense of voluntary, of course, um, but it is certainly uh, a form of people coming to the United States um, and you know, millions of Americans descend directly from that wave of so-called immigration, that forced uh, immigration that occurred uh, in the Atlantic slave trade. Moving forward a little bit, uh, from 1800 to 1900, we had sort of a shift toward more regulated immigration. Uh, and uh, during this period of time, states often had their own laws about immigration. So there was not a national federal immigration policy during this period of time, at least at the beginning of it, um, that states had their own laws. Different states would have different laws about who got to come to the United States, how many people got to come, what the requirements were there. Um, but uh, in 1849, uh, there's a Supreme Court case that struck down two laws, one from New York and one from Massachusetts, um, and it cited, those were both laws that taxed incoming immigrants. Um, and what that Supreme Court decision did is it established federal control over immigration. It said uh, individual states cannot set their own conflicting immigration policies. Um, instead, this is a federal issue. So that was in 1849, Supreme Court case. Subsequently, 1889 uh, was the what is known as the Chinese Exclusion Case. Um, and what had happened there is Congress had passed laws known as the Chinese Exclusion Laws or the Chinese Exclusion Acts um, that specifically said that people from China and in some other cases, other parts of Asia uh, were severely limited from immigrating. They couldn't um, own property in some cases. Um, and it was a, a very strict racially based uh, law, set of laws that limited immigration from Asia. Um, and what the Supreme Court determined in 1989 um, was that congressional power over immigration is nearly unreviewable. So the Supreme Court basically said, yes, these laws like do discriminate, um, but we don't really have the power to, um, out, uh, to, to overturn this because Congress has the authority to set immigration policy. So 
So that was, um, so 1849 established federal control, 1889 moved toward congressional <coughs> control over immigration. Moving into the early 20th century, early 20th century, in 1921 was what is known as the Emergency Quota Act. The Emergency Quota Act. And what that was, um, was racially based and country based immigration quotas that were determined based on the 1910 census. And what that meant, in effect, was that new sets of immigrants were basically prevented from coming to the United States based on racial and country lines. So it said, if you didn't have a group of people here in 1910, you can't have a group of people here in 1921. Um, and so that was that was an early immigration restriction to, uh, to especially limit people who were not considered white. 1932, the Great Depression is in full swing. Um, and the United States essentially shuts down immigration. Immigration went um, from relatively high numbers uh, in the late 1920s to almost zero starting in 1932 um, up to the war. <coughs> the reason for that um, was because uh, the country basically decided, like, we can't provide for the people we have, shut down immigration. And that's something that happens a lot um, over time. And you'll notice these sort of waves of increasing immigration and then big uh, cutbacks. 1943, those Chinese Exclusion Acts, the Chinese Exclusion Laws that I referenced earlier were repealed, followed by the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952, which is known as the INA. And you'll see that in some of uh, the reading, uh, so I wanted to emphasize it. You'll see some of the references to like the INA or the INA of 1952. Um, and what that is, is that is the uh, controlling legislation on immigration in Congress which repealed or replaced the Emergency Quota Act and removed racial categories on immigration policy. What it established instead is a set of preference categories for legal immigration based on things like family status and employment. And we're going to look at both of those um, in just a minute when we talk about family-sponsored immigration and employment-based immigration. But 1952 is when that gets started. It says, here is a bunch of categories. Um, and here's how we decide who comes into the United States. Um, that is still the controlling legislation. It's been amended and modified um, several times since then. We get to 1980. We have the Refugee Act of 1980. Refugee Act of 1980. And the Refugee Act of 1980 defined refugee based on UN norms and set annual quotas for refugees. So what it said is we should deal with this refugee thing. The UN has established what a refugee is. We'll talk about what that is in just a second. Um, but we are going to define what a refugee is based on these UN norms, uh, let in some refugees in the United States. Interestingly, uh, at the same time, they reduced the cap on other legal immigrants to sort of trade off um, so that the, the total number of people did not increase that much. All right, flying forward in time all the way to post 9-11. So 9-11 happens, right after 9-11 happens, uh, a lot of people sort of freak out about uh, immigration in the context of terrorism. Uh, whether that's a reasonable concern or not is, is certainly debatable. Uh, but um, there were several uh, congressional pieces of legislation um, that went through that established more stricter guidelines on uh, immigration. One is the Patriot Act, and the other is the Real ID Act. Two words, Real ID, like real identification. Um, and both of those increased restrictions, monitoring, and enforcement on immigration into the United States. So stricter background checks, limited the number of people who could come in certain cases, uh, required more paperwork, more delays, more uh, sort of logistical stuff on the front end, bureaucracy. Finally, coming forward, I wanted to reference the DREAM Act, because we'll be talking about that um, when you start looking at the packet affirmative. Uh, and the DREAM Act was introduced first in 2001, and then again in Congress a couple times in the early 2010s. And what that would be is a path to citizenship for undocumented immigrants who graduate from a U.S. high school and go to college or join the military. That is not passed, but uh, there will be a discussion of whether that's a good idea or not in your labs and in your evidence. Uh, but the idea would be that there's a whole set of people um, who came to the United States, most of them as kids, They've now graduated high school, they're trying to go to college. Maybe we should try and figure out a way to, to let those people stay. All right, definitions time. Um, a lot of these words are a little bit legally precise, um, and so I wanted to just take a second to sort of talk about some terms that I'll be using in the rest of the conversation in terms you'll see in the literature, um, and just sort of so you know what those words mean. 
So the first one is alien. Alien is a person who is not a citizen and not a national. So not a US citizen and not a US national. So anyone who is not currently a citizen is considered an alien. Yeah, term. Uh, a citizen is a person who is one of the following. And I'll listen slowly because there's four things. So a citizen, a person who is one, you could be more, but one or more of the following. First, someone who was born in the United States. Second, someone whose parent is a citizen. And remember, you only have to be one of these things. So uh, born in the US and or parent is a citizen and or someone who was an alien who has been naturalized as a citizen. And what that means is going through the citizenship process. We'll talk about that in a second. Or someone who was born in Puerto Rico, Guam, or the US Virgin Islands. So alien is a person who is not a US citizen or a US national. A citizen is a person who was born in the US, or their parent was a citizen, or they're a former alien who has now been naturalized, or they were born in Puerto Rico, Guam, or the Virgin Island. Yeah? What does it mean to be a US national? Oh, it's so fun. Uh, so uh, I included this in the notes. Uh, a US national is someone who was born in American Samoa or the Northern Mariana Islands. Um, and they have a choice about whether they want to be a citizen or a US national. So US national is born in American Samoa or the Northern Mariana Islands.
A naturalized citizen, naturalized citizen, is someone who used to be an LPR, and then they got their citizenship. The federal government contrasts this with the term natural born citizen, which appears in all places in the Constitution. And so what they mean by that is a natural born citizen is someone who had citizenship from birth because either they're, uh, because they were born in the United States. And then a naturalized citizen is someone who uh, got their citizenship through the citizenship process. Refugees. So we've been talking a lot, you've probably heard a lot about refugees um, in the news. Um, obviously, Syria is a big place where refugees uh, would be trying to come from right now. There's a lot of them. Um, and over the last few years, there's been huge refugee flows, especially into Europe. Um, there's a lot of places that uh, are looking for people to take refugees. Um, a refugee is a person who is outside of their home country. They're not currently in their home country. And they're not in the U.S. either, or at least a refugee to the United States. And they can't return to their home country because of fear of persecution based on one of five things. I'll list them a couple times. So can't return to their home country based on fear of persecution on race, religion, nationality, social group membership, or political opinion. I'll list it again. Can't return to their home country is a credible fear of persecution based on their race, their religion, their nationality, their social group membership, or their political opinion. In the United States, there's an annual cap on refugees, and that is set by the president. So the Refugee Act in the early 1980s established that the United States has a policy for taking refugees. The number of refugees of the country that those refugees can come from is established annually by the president. or asylum seeker is very similar to a refugee. Same categories, except they're not in a third country. They are either already in the United States, because they, maybe they were visiting here and couldn't return home, that kind of thing, or they are at a US point of entry, like a border or an airport or a port. So a refugee is someone who is in a third party country. They're not in their home country. They're not in the United States. An asylee or an asylum seeker is someone who is in, in the United States when they determine that they need to seek asylum. There is no annual cap on asylum seekers, asylees, but they are evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis by the immigration courts. So um, unlike refugees where the United States announces in advance, this is how many refugees we're going to take, asylees are already in the U.S. Um, and so they get their uh, status evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. A visa, a visa is a word you're going to hear a lot, um, and it is an endorsement on a passport indicating that that person is allowed to enter, leave, or stay for a particular period of time in a particular country. So if you visit some countries globally, you might need to get a visa in order to visit. If you are flying, if you're like a European citizen and you're flying um, from uh, through the United States, um, you will get just like an automatic endorsement. We have reciprocal arrangements with the EU. But if you're from other countries that don't have reciprocal arrangements with the US and you're flying to the US, you get what's called a transit visa. So you just get a like, stamp on your passport that says, yes, you can land in Chicago O'Hare and then you land in Canada or whatever. Um, so a visa is just an endorsement that means you get to stay somewhere for a particular period of time. And sometimes you would then get to stay for a long period of time. All right, undocumented alien. This is what the, the term the government uses to refer to someone who entered the U.S. illegally and or uh, overstayed their visa. So someone who entered illegally or maybe someone who came here legally but overstayed their visa. They had a tourist visa that was good for three months. They stayed for several years. These are the people um, that Trump is looking to be subject to deportation. This is also a relatively controversial term. Some people call undocumented workers. Uh, some people call illegal aliens. Um, that's, that's what we're talking about here. 
government would refer to it as an undocumented alien, meaning someone who did not have the documents to live in the United States. And then uh, there's the bonus there of what a U.S. national would cover that. Yeah? Are there like, I mean, is there reasons why people would help you on Yes. Uh, the main benefit is that uh, citizens have a much higher ability to bring family members over than people with LPR status do. So um, when we get to family-sponsored immigration, um, they're ha being able to convert to citizenship dramatically increases your ability to have family members join you in the United States. Um, and there is a delay on that. There's like a five-year delay. Um, but that's, that's a big reason to get citizenship. Um, it also gives you um, enhanced protections against possible deportations. There are some categories where, uh, while an LPR has permission to live here permanently and work here permanently, there are some uh, like prime categories that could lead to deportation from LPR that would not for a citizen. So um, it's, it's like a higher, it's an enhanced level of legal protection. Okay, immigration governed in the United States. So immigration governance. Uh, there is a state versus federal immigration debate. Um, despite the fact that uh, the Constitution includes that uh, immigration is governed by the federal legislative branch. Uh, but state versus federal. So in the first hundred years, the states had their own immigration laws. We talked about that. They basically, they were able to prevent certain groups from coming to their state. They were able to tax immigrants more highly. They could have, have establish their own restrictions. But when we're talking about restrictions on legal immigration, we're generally talking about federal legal restrictions. The Supreme Court has ruled pretty consistently um, that the states, at least in, mo in modern times, uh, that states can't regulate immigration where the federal government does not. So there's a 2010 case, Arizona versus the United States, um, where Arizona was had an extremely strict immigration law uh, that had much higher penalties than a similar federal government law. The Supreme Court did strike that down, saying that state can't, even though it mirrored the federal law but with stricter enforcement, that states do not have the ability to have stricter enforcement um, that, of those federal immigration laws. Uh, the modern issue that is uh, involved here is the question of sanctuary cities. Um, and sanctuary cities are sort of threatening that, just that traditional federal state division. Sanctuary city is when uh, a city will indicate that they are not going to participate in the deportation process, that they will not uh, aid the federal government in doing deportations or looking for people who might be undocumented. Um, and that uh, um, is, is sort of threatening to uh, challenge the traditional division between the federal government and the states. Uh, the Trump administration is looking to crack down on sanctuary cities. Um, and that, that will be something we'll definitely be debating this year. Uh, but in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8 includes a clause that entrusts the federal legislative branch with the power to establish a uniform rule of naturalization. So in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8 says federal legislative branch is determining who gets to naturalize into the United States. Congress. Congress has primary responsibility for immigration, as I just noted. The president and the agencies are tasked with enforcing the laws that uh, Congress provides on immigration. We talked about the Immigration and Nationality Act, the INA, from 1952, um, and that has been modified a bunch of times since then uh, to sort of set our nation's immigration laws. The president is tasked, uh, along with the agencies, of enforcing those laws. Um, but Congress argued that the Obama administration was not faithfully enforcing all immigration laws, especially with regards to his uh, immigration executive order. Some members of the GOP considered that to be unconstitutional, that, that those immigration executive orders should be declared unconstitutional because they were too far, too much better, or too much presidential control, executive control over immigration, which should be a congressional issue. But uh, the opposite is occurring now. Congress is out ahead of, or sorry, Trump is out ahead of Congress on enforcement. Um, and Congress could say, you know, you have gone too far, but they have, they have chosen not to do so, so far. Uh, and then the other role for the president, as mentioned earlier briefly, is that the president is in charge of setting the annual refugee cap. So how many refugees come to the United States uh, in any particular year um, is set by the president. There are uh, a lot of agencies, really, that are involved in immigration, but we're only going to talk about four major ones. Uh, the first is the Department of Homeland Security, the DHS. 
The Department of Homeland Security, it has primary responsibility for immigration. Primary responsibility for immigration. And they have three sub-agencies, which I included there, because uh, I'm not home law, uh, that, that uh, do the debt enforcement. The first is the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, the USCIS. That's where you go to apply for your visa. They're the ones who determine the exact regulations. They you know, set the standards for what paperwork is required, doing the interviews, that sort of thing. Then there's Customs and Border Protection, who's responsible for literally like border enforcement. And there's Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICEIC, uh, which is responsible for uh, actually the physical sort of deportations of people who are determined to be undocumented. If you uh, are on Twitter sometime and search hashtag abolish ICE, um, you will see that there's a huge thing going on in the last couple of weeks um, where people are arguing that we should just eliminate uh, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Office, that we should not have a group of people who are tasked with deporting people. Um, and that's, that's sort of a, a very recent uh, debate that's occurring. The second major agency that's responsible for immigration is the State Department, the DOS Department of State. The Department of State is the one who actually issues the visa via uh, their whole network of uh, embassies in other countries. That's where you would go to get a visa to come to the United States in the State Department. The third agency is the DOJ, the Department of Justice. They're the ones who do the immigration courts. So if you are an asylee who needs to go uh, seek uh, an immigration hearing, if you are someone who overstayed uh, your visa and you need to try and get that extended or you're looking to convert your visa, you need a hearing, um, that is through the Executive Office of Immigration Review, EOIR, and that's under the DOJ. So that is a court system with immigration courts, um, which is actually relatively complicated, but we'll get into that um, as we delve into the topic. But the, the, the thing that you need to know right now um, is that there is an immigration court system it's through the Executive Office of Immigration Review under the DOJ. Yeah. Are they associated with like the judicial branch? Yeah. Uh, well, it's it's through the Department of Justice, um, and it is a court system, but it is um, and it can be escalated to standard federal courts. But in general, there are immigration courts, so um, you would not probably go to like the same judges would also hear like a tax issue, or would also hear you know like a drunk driving case. Um, there are, are immigration courts, um, but it is through the DOJ and it is like a court system. Yeah. Uh, and finally, the Department of Health and Human Services, the HHS. Uh, and in the Department of Health and Human Services, the HHS, is the Office of Refugee Resettlement. So they are responsible for um, helping to get refugees resettled, um, the funding for refugee resettlement, determining where the refugees in particular go once they're in the United States, um, and establishing just sort of like aid to refugees within the Department of Health and Human Services. So the ORR, Office of Refugee Resettlement. All right, so that's that sort of um, gets to the end of section one. Um, and so the next section delves into exactly who gets to come to the United States and how they get to do that. And there are basically two major categories. Um, there are immigrant visas and non-immigrant visas. And then the last section includes some additional um, other categories as well as sort of a summary of what's going on right now, what are the major issues of immigration. Um, but in terms of immigrant visas, the overall thing you need to know about immigrant visas uh, is that there are numer annual numerical limits on immigrant visas. So there is an overall cap on the number of people who can come in uh, to the United States in any particular year. And then there are also what they refer to as country caps. And what that means uh, is that in general, there are some exceptions, but in general, the goal is that no more than 7% of immigrants in a single year can come from a particular country. So when we're looking at the pool of immigrants, of people who are authorized to legally immigrate to the United States, get LPR status, and then maybe eventually citizenship, no more than 7% of them in any particular year can be from a particular country. Um, and that particularly affects countries like India and Mexico and the Philippines, um, who are all bumping up against that country cap. There are some other countries that also bump against that cap relatively often, but those are, those are the ones that do the most. And then there are sort of three major categories of immigrant visas. So three categories of immigrant visas. The first is family-sponsored immigration. 
similar to just the next three sections. Family-sponsored immigration, employment-based immigration, and the diversity immigrant visa. So major categories of immigrant visas, family-sponsored, employment-based, and the diversity immigrant visa. Looking at family-sponsored immigration, this is by far the largest category of immigrants to the United States. About two-thirds of total immigrants to the United States these days come via family sponsorship. Two-thirds of total immigrants come via family sponsorship. That family-sponsored immigration is capped, meaning subject to the 7% per country cap, for all relatives other than immediate relatives. So it's called a permeable cap. Because what it means is if there are more immediate relatives, that does not subject to the 7% cap. So what is an immediate relative? An immediate relative is your spouse, your unmarried children who are under 21 years of old age, parents of citizens who are over 21 years of age. So the, the family member is a citizen over 21 parent, and widows and widowers of citizens. So if you were a spouse of a citizen and that spouse has now passed away, uh, that is considered immediate relatives. So immediate relatives are not subject uh, to that 7% per country cap. Non-immediate relatives, non-immediate relatives are known as preference immigrants. And the reason for that is because it goes in order of preference based on how close the relationship is. So how long the line is between you who want to come to the United States and arriving in the United States varies dramatically based on how close the relationship is um, to that person. So siblings, etc., cetera, um, do have sometimes the ability to immigrate, but it is based on how close uh, the, you are related to that person. Um, and that is subject to the 7% cap, which means that if you are a preference immigrant from a country that tries to send more than 7 like more than 7% of total immigrants to the United States, uh, the line between you and becoming a citizen is a lot longer than if you're than if you're from a country that doesn't send very many people to the United States. So 7% from any particular country, uh, and non-immediate relatives, um, the total number is cap. All right, employment-based immigration. Employment-based immigration. We're looking at about 140,000 people per year. How many? 140,000 per year total. It is capped, so there is still a 7% per country cap on employment-based immigration. And the way we do employment-based immigration are what is known as rank preference categories. What that means is that there are five categories of people who might be able to permanently move to the United States based on their employment status. But it goes down the list. So if you are in a higher category, you have a much higher chance of getting to be part of that 140,000 per year than if you are in a lower category. Does that make sense? And we're gonna, we're gonna go through the categories. But there are five, five legal categories, um, and the higher category you're in, so number one, better than number five through the list. All right, so category number one are referred to as priority workers. Priority workers. These are people of extraordinary ability, and that's the word the government uses, extraordinary ability in the sciences, arts, education, business, or athletics. You don't need to write down that exact list, but the idea is extraordinary ability is the emphasis here. Or multinational executives. So there's a, there's a group of people, if you work for a multinational co uh, corporation, you're an executive of that, you have uh, quite high priority um, in coming to the United States. So priority workers, extraordinary ability. The second category is referred to as professionals holding advanced degrees and persons of exceptional ability. And what that means uh, is that people who have extremely high degrees or people who uh, have uh, ex 
exceptional ability in those same categories, the arts, the sciences, education, business. Uh, so category number one, you have to be extraordinary. Category number two, you only have to be exceptional. Uh, the exact difference there is a little bit hard to hard to wheedle out um, just from the general understanding, but there, there is a legal difference between those two things. Okay, number three is professionals and other workers. So professionals and other workers are skilled workers, meaning they have uh, they have uh, a profession that they are skilled in, but they maybe don't have exceptional or extraordinary ability. Category number four is certain special immigrants. Again, that's the government term. Certain special immigrants. And certain special immigrants are religious workers, some foreign service workers, so to your question earlier about people who work for the government, some foreign service workers um, who are not citizens, retired employees of those international organizations. So you're not the multinational <coughs> executive anymore, you're the retired multinational executive, you'd like to move to the United States for your retirement, and a couple other small categories. And then category number five, Uh, is employment creation and investors. Employment creation and investors. And those are people who are gonna invest at least half a million, but usually more like a million dollars in a new business that employs at least 10 US citizens as workers. So you wanna come to the United States to start your awesome business, you got a million dollars to do it, uh, you're gonna employ at least 10 US workers, you get, you get some ability to come in. There are some very small, separate categories um, that are not subject to the overall cap um, that we established uh, after or during and after the war on terror for uh, Afghan and Iraqi uh, citizens who have worked for the U.S. government. So it's mostly interpreters, although there's some other people as well, there's been bodyguards, that sort of thing. So there's a small additional category for people from Afghanistan and Iraq who assisted the United States government or the United States military um, that then get some ability to immigrate to the United States. Uh, and the reason that that was originally established uh, was because uh, once someone is known as working during the war on terror, once someone became known as working for the United States government, that often put them in some problems with uh, the people that their own government, being given that there was a war. Um, and so people who were interpreters in the United States, or people who served as bodyguards, that kind of thing, um, were able to come to the United States. There's some debate, or there is there is debate, um, about how effectively that works, like how in practice do many of these people get to come to the United States, uh, is very debatable. Um, but the idea behind that category was that we should provide for those people. All right, the next category is the diversity immigrant visa. The diversity immigrant visa. The diversity immigrant visa is legal immigration from countries that don't send very many people to the United States. And the idea there is that in addition to the 7% cap, even with the 7% cap, there are a lot of countries that send almost no one to the United States. And so the diversity immigrant visa is an additional way to come to the United States if you are from a country that sends very few people to the United States. In particular, it is 50,000 visas, 50,000 visas annually, given to people who are from a country that has sent less than 50,000 people over the last five years. So I'll say that again. There's a lot of fives now. It's 50,000 visas given annually to people who are from a country that over the last five years have sent fewer than 50,000 people total. So it's not 50,000 people per country. It's 50,000 visas that are allocated to people who are from a country that has not sent very many people. Uh, they are, those people are selected by a lottery. So um, if you are from a country that has not sent very many people to the United States and you want to come to the United States, uh, you can enter the diversity immigrant visa lottery after being uh, background checked and investigated. And we'll talk about that in a second because that's why this is so controversial. Right now, uh, when it was established, uh, it was mostly countries, small countries in Western Europe. Now that has shifted, um, and most of the people who are currently selected for the diversity immigrant visas are from Eastern Europe and North Africa. 
Um, that, that has just sort of shifted over time based on what countries were already sending people to the United States and what people want to come to the United States. This is extremely controversial right now. Um, some of you may have heard of the Diversity Immigrant Visa, and the reason you might have heard of it um, is because Trump um, has made a bunch of claims uh, that the Diversity Immigrant Visa, uh, he would like to eliminate. He thinks it's very problematic. Um, he has claimed that the people who are selected by the Diversity Immigrant Visa are not vetted, um, and those people don't have skills. And so when he talks about immigration, he talks about like bringing the most skilled people, or it should be uh, you know, based on a points system, it shouldn't just be random. Um, those are phrases that he's used when describing the Diversity Immigrant Visa. He would like to end that whole program altogether. Um, for what it's worth, uh, that particular claim is not true. Um, people who are applying for the diversity immigrant visa are vetted the exact same way everyone else is. So they have to undergo the same background checks as anyone coming to the United States who wants to come to the United States permanently. And they still have to meet some educational work requirements. They don't have to be you know, a person of exceptional mobility, but they do have to be employable. They do have to have um, at least a high school education, in some cases a college education, so they're not, they're not required to have advanced degrees, but um, he sort of describes this as like people sending people who have no employability in the United States, um, and that turns out, and, and are not vetted, uh, and that turns out not to be the case. So it is a lottery, uh, but it's not just a lottery that like anyone in the world can join, you have to be pre-vetted. So those are the major categories of immigrant visas. There is also a separate category, oh yeah, please. Okay, so, say like a country like Mexico, how will it be some percent of the yeah, so um, family-sponsored immigration is most of it. It's about two-thirds of it. Um, and there are separate lines um, based on uh, family-sponsored immigration and employment-based immigration. And then within those categories, it just sort of rolls down the mountain. So um, there is a cap for employment immigration. Um, so employment-based is 140000 per year total. Uh, and family-sponsored immigration is about 226,000 people per year. And then within those categories, it then determines based on how highly ranked you are, um, how close of a family member you are, if you're looking for family-sponsored immigration, or what your employment status is with employment immigration. And there presumably are some people who are both, you know, the, the sibling of someone who's a citizen and also someone of extraordinary ability. Um, they would have to just sort of decide which process they want to go through. Uh, based on which had the better shot at that time. Good question. Yeah? People with LPR have the same status of people uh, who are national citizens, I like social services and social security. Uh, they definitely get into all of those things, and they do have access to, to most of those things. Um, it sort of depends um, on the specific program, and a lot of that is uh, potentially changing. Like the Trump administration wants to eliminate the ability of to get access to welfare, um, depending on their immigration status, even legal immigrants uh, in the future. Um, but yes, for the most part. Yep. Can Edward Snowden be an example of asylum or not? Uh, well, <laughs> as soon, uh, to the United States, like could he apply for a U.S. asylum or could he apply for asylum for another country? Uh, I'm just talking about, like, in, uh, I know he already has asylum in Russia, so I was just curious if that was like an example. Uh, so, he was in Russia and then declared that he needed protection, that's correct. Um, he ideally would like to go to a different country, like I don't think he really wants to stay in Russia long term. He was trying to get to some South American countries and was unable to do so. Um, there was some question about whether he was going to be able to fly through Cuba and they were going to let him fly through there um, to get somewhere else or maybe to stay in Cuba. Um, but yes, I mean, he could be someone who is seeking asylum. Different countries have different policies for asylum seekers. So in the United States, so let's say Edward Snowden were from Russia. Um, in the United States, he probably would not be eligible for asylum um, because his, uh, I guess maybe he could argue that it's based on his political beliefs, but probably um, the United States would not give him asylum were he to be from another country coming to the United States because it's not based on his race or his religion or his nationality um, that he wants asylum, but different countries have the ability to set that differently. Russia has basically said, like, we will give him long-term ability to stay here, um, and so that's, that's that's why he's there. Um, but that's also why he was like living in an airport for a little while and like trying to try and figure out where to go. Good question. So it's a, an interesting case. All right, non-immigrant visas. So immigrant visas.
visas. Remember, are for people who are trying to come to the United States, live here permanently, and have the ability to work here forever. Okay? LPR status, green cards, stay here the rest of their lives. They don't have to stay here the rest of their lives, but they have the permission to do so. So some immigrants decide to not stay here forever, but they have the ability to work here permanently, and they have the legal status that allows them to. Non-immigrant visas are a separate set of visas that it is debatable, and you will have this debate in your labs, whether these are part of the topic. And what I mean by that is that our topic this year says legal immigration, right? Restrictions on legal immigration. And depending on how that term, that phrase is defined, some people think that non-immigrant visas are a part of legal immigration, and some people think non-immigrant visas are not a part of legal immigration. We're going to talk about them briefly, because um, there are a couple of types of non-immigrant visas um, that, people, that, that probably will be debated on this topic, almost certainly will be. Um, but just know, keep in the back of your mind, um, that these are non-immigrant visas, and there are people who say that that is not part of the legal immigration process. All right, so non-immigrant visas are visas, remember a visa is permission to go to a country and stay for a particular period of time, uh, for non-immigrants, which means people who are coming to live or work in the United States on a temporary basis. Temporary basis. So that temporary basis might be a pretty long period of time, it might be five years, for example, but it's not forever. The main categories, and if you are using the typed doc at the, at the end of this section, there's a link to all of the non-immigrant visa categories. It's about two pages long. Like I'm going to print it, and it's, it's really long. But the main categories that we're going to talk about are for workers. And there are a lot of non-immigrant worker visas. And in general, the idea of the non-immigrant worker visa is that there might be United States companies that want to, uh, that have a job opening, and then they cannot find someone in the United States to fill that job. They need someone with very particular expertise. Maybe they're a country expert, maybe they uh, speak a certain set of languages, maybe they have uh, advanced degrees in something that they are looking for. Uh, and they want to fill that job, but they can't fill it with someone from the United States. And so there is a category of visa for people to come work for a US company for a particular period of time. And the reason that you would seek this instead of uh, going through employment-based immigration um, is that, as we discussed earlier, employment-based immigration um, is capped, and it is uh, very challenging and a very time-consuming process to bring someone over, and they have to prove their, you know, of extraordinary ability, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the, uh, another way for people who do not currently have US citizenship to come work in the United States for a defined period of time uh, the most relevant one for debate that you will hear about a lot is known as the H-1B visa, H-1B, and that's literally just the like name of the type of visa. So there are H visas, there are H-1, now there's H-1B. Uh, and that allows U.S. companies to hire foreign workers for specialty occupations. The company applies for that visa on behalf of the person, so um, you can't get one of these visas unless you have been hired by a company. So a company will say, we want to hire someone, we can't find anyone in the United States with this degree, here is someone uh, that we have identified that we think needs to come to our company, to work for our company. The company will apply for that. And then they have to prove that they can't hire someone in the United States with those qualifications or for that job. So um, the idea of this type of visa, um, at least if you're from the perspective of a company or uh, a lot of these are tech companies, um, is that you're not displacing a US worker, you are hiring someone that we could not hire in the United States. Obviously it is debatable whether that's the case, but that's the, that's the goal. Um, however, there is much, much, much more demand for H-1B visas than supply. Um, the, they become available annually. They all go on the first day, um, sort of like the Black Friday for visas, um, which is that you know companies who are trying to hire an H-1B worker um, apply for that immediately, um, and there is way, 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 way more demand than there is supply. Um, someone with an H-1B status um, has permission to live in the United States for a defined period of time, uh, usually about five years, but. Um, someone with, who does have an H-1B, once they are in the United States, can then apply for 
LPR status based on their employment-based immigration. So it's sort of a way to get someone over into the United States working for a company um, that is more efficient than the longer applying for LPR status. Yeah. 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 No, uh, the government determines who gets the visa, um, but the company applies on behalf of a particular worker. So let's say you uh, live in, uh, where do you want to live? All right, you're living in Italy, uh, and you're an aeronautics expert, okay? Uh, and you just like have, you develop this thing for aeronautics. Boeing wants you really, really, really to come work for them. Um, they would apply and say, we need to hire this person. They are an aeronautics expert. They're the only person who could possibly do this cool thing that we're trying to do with our awesome planes. Uh, and then if they grant that, if the government would grant the H-1B visa, then you could come work in the United States. Once you're working in the United States, you could then, if you're like an extraordinary ability, proven genius, turns out to be awesome, apply for uh, an employment-based immigration to get LPR status. But sometimes people with H-1B status just come work here for a few years and then go back. You, you know, you got your, you got your family uh, living in Italy. You want to go back to Venice or whatever. Um, you go, you go back there um, after working here for a, a shorter period of time. Yeah. Is there a limit on how many H-1Bs a company can apply for? Uh, I think effectively. Well, so there is a very a, a small limit of how many there are total. Um, I believe companies can apply for more than one. Um, but the I, I think that it's basically like they try to allocate. Um, but large companies do apply for, for many more than a single H-1B visa. It's not just like one per company. Um, bigger companies have, a, have many more H-1B workers. And a lot of these people, again, are, are in technology um, field. I thought I saw one more hand. No? Okay. Uh, the second category in here um, are visitor and tourist visas. So depending on where you live, uh, you might need a visa to come visit the United States. Uh, and the way that works um, is that the United States has a list of countries that we have visa waivers with. And what that means um, is that we have a reciprocal arrangement with most of Western Europe and a lot of Latin America as well as a few other countries um, that are, we can travel, American citizens can travel to uh, those countries without needing a visa, and people from that country can travel to America without needing a specific visa. You just like automatically get your passport stamped. So if any of you uh, happen to be United States citizens who have ever visited one of these countries and you didn't need to go to the embassy in advance, that's a visa waiver country. So if you're going to Italy, uh, you do not need uh, to go to the Italian embassy and apply for a visa. You just land in Italy, go through passport control, and they stamp your passport that allows you to stay a certain period of time. A lot of times, even in visa waiver countries, you have to prove that you're intending to leave. So if any of you have ever visited another country where you needed to show that you have like tickets back to the United States or you visited the United States and you needed to show that you have tickets back to another country, the reason for that um, is because these tourist visas are for a limited period of time. Um, they're not to allow you to move to Italy, they're allowing you to you know, go see Rome or whatever. Um, the, uh, additionally, most of those visas do not allow you to work in that country. So they're very strict that if you are going on you know, uh, your, your grand European adventure or your grand, you know, if you're going to Machu Picchu, uh, you can't get a job um, in Peru. You can't just be like, I'm going to Peru, I'm climbing Machu Picchu, that was awesome, now I want to get a job. That is generally not allowed um, under tourist visas because the idea is that you are there as a visitor, not as a worker. So have reciprocal arrangements with many countries. Countries where you don't, where we don't have a reciprocal arrangement, you do need to go to the embassy and get a visa, um, even in order to visit. And that was when we were talking earlier when I mentioned transit visas. That's the other thing where it's like you're flying through the United States, you might need to get a visa to anywhere you're coming from. So if I'm like in Machu Picchu yep. and I get like rock or something, I need money, so I like do post banks. Does that like count? Like I become a bus driver. Technically or like effectively? Like technically yes. Like technically you would not be able to work. Um, sometimes, depending on what the job is, so if the job is based in the United States, so let's say uh, I work for Woodward Academy, uh, and let's say I'm going to Machu Picchu uh, with Woodward Academy, right, and I'm like taking a group of kids there, uh, which Woodward just did, it was very cool, there's lots of pictures, uh, and uh, they take their group of kids to Machu Picchu, technically I would be, as an employee of Woodward Academy, getting paid while I'm in Machu Picchu, right, because I'm like an employee. That doesn't count because I'm working for the U.S. company, but if I want to go work for like Peruvian Postmates, um, then technically uh, that would not be allowed under my tourist visa. Um, certainly, there are some people who are, you know, under the if you're like babysitting, uh, probably you're not, you know, they're not reporting that to the government, and so that's not like a big issue. Um, but technically, tourists should not allow to work. Um, and so, 
company, you are probably not hiring someone who's going to get you in trouble in that country. Um, but <coughs> Individual students can also apply. 
Uh, they need to demonstrate that they have been accepted at a high school or college. So they need to demonstrate, like, I have a school that I'm going to, not just like, I want to come to the United States uh, and go to school. Um, once someone has been accepted by a high school or college university, uh, they then apply for a visa based on their student status um, in order to stay in the United States for a defined period of time. And then the government issues that visa. Yep. Um, for non-immigrant and immigrant visas, is there also like the same like, vetting process? In general, uh, so when you say vetting, you mean like security vetting? Yeah, yeah. So um, the, uh, the tourist visas for people who have, um, for countries that we have visa waivers with, it's a, it's a much lower process, although they are still vetted. Like to fly into the United States, you still have to be vetted. Um, for the longer visas, there are like interviews and background checks and that sort of thing. Um, and those, that's a similar process. It's a little bit more rigorous the longer the time is, but overall, yes. All right, last major category that we're going to talk about um, is refugees and asylum seekers. Refugees and asylum seekers. So we talked earlier about what refugees and asylum seekers are. Remember, refugees are someone who is not in their home country and not in the United States, and they are trying to, uh, they, they have a credible fear of persecution uh, based on those five categories, uh, and they are trying to come to the United States to seek refugee status. Uh, the way, uh, and asylum seekers are those same people, but they're already in the United States. The way it works is that if you are approved as a refugee and resettled into the United States, uh, or if you are, your asylum application is approved, you can apply for a green card, meaning legal, permanent, lawful permanent resident status. You can legally work here and stay forever. One year after you've entered the United States as a refugee. So a year after you get here as a refugee, you can apply for LPR status, However, you can work immediately, and that's, that's, a, that's just like a difference for refugees, which is that refugees are allowed to work in the United States as soon as they get here, um, but they don't apply for LPR status until a year later. Then five years after arriving in the United States, a refugee or an asylee can apply for citizenship, and that um, allows them, then they have to take the citizenship test, they have to take the language test, so all of those things, in order to get citizenship. That's also a little bit different than usual because the, that first year before a refugee gets LPR counts toward the five years. So in most cases, it's you get LPR status and then five years later can apply for citizenship. In the case of refugees, it's you get to the United States as a refugee, one year later you can apply for LPR status and then theoretically four years later you can apply for citizenship. A lot of people don't do that right away, but that's the, that's the sort of timeline for that. The president sets the target number for refugees annually. I think in what will be a, a surprise to no one, uh, Trump cut the quota by a lot um, after the Obama administration increased it. So the Obama administration just increased it to about 140,000 people a year. Trump cut that quota by more than half. And then Trump's travel ban, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, further reduced access to people from countries who are trying to send refugees. So the number of Syrian people, for example, who were getting refugee status in the United States uh, dropped precipitously. Same with Iraq, same with all the countries on the travel ban list. 2018 uh, is on pace to have the lowest number of refugees accepted in more than 40 years by the United States. So 40 years of refugee acceptance 2018 is on pace to be the lowest number. And effectively, it is almost a 70% drop from 2016. So Trump cut the numbers by a little more than half, but the addition of the travel ban also further reduced the numbers that were being accepted, which means that we're not even reaching the cap, if that makes sense. So there is a capped number that Trump set, and the actual number being accepted is lower than the cap. For your reference, so we talked earlier about what a refugee is, um, a person with that credible fear of persecution. Uh, globally, less than 1% of people who are eligible to be refugees ultimately get resettled in another country. So 99% of people who have a credible fear of persecution in their home country, um, based on that list of things, race, religion, nationality, etc., um, don't get resettled in another country. And some of them don't seek refugee status, and some of them aren't approved for refugee status. So there's like multiple, there's a lot of factors there. Um, but when you're thinking about the total pool of people who globally uh, might have the access to refugee status, uh, less 
people would also have the problem, like they would also fit in another category, like persecution of their political opinion. Um, but um, I do think that there are people who think that gender should be added. Uh, one of the issues with refugees, and this is you know um, something that's really challenging, is that there are hundreds of millions of people who qualify for refugee status, um, and there are so few people getting uh, established. And so I think if you were the UN, uh, the, the argument the UN would make is like there are all, like it's a huge problem already. Obviously, the flip side of that is that there are tons and tons of people who are being persecuted in their home country and don't have access to refugee status, um, which is supposed to sort of be the like last resort against things like genocide, against things like uh, you know uh, ins <coughs> enslavement of peoples, against things like uh, you know uh, persecution overall, uh, jailing of people for political reasons, and that sort of thing. Um, so I do think that there are people who would like to add gender, sexual orientation, uh, trans status, et cetera, um, to that group, but um, it, it hasn't happened so far. And, and the U.S. abides by the U.N. definition of refugee, so I'm not, I, I assume the U.S. could also say, like, and by the way, we will also accept other people, and we will also define refugee more broadly. Um, we have generally agreed not to define refugee less broadly than the U.N., if that makes sense. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Yep. Does the U.S. work with like other countries to decide like where some of the refugee status is? Yeah. So there are international refugee organizations that help to figure out where a particular person is going to go. Um, the UN also works pretty broadly to figure out like where a particular person is going to go. But a lot of it is sort of a country will say, "Here's how many people we're going to take," and then international organizations like the UN and refugee-specific organizations um, try to allocate those slots among the people. So uh, the U.S. is able to say, like, we will not take any more than this amount. And obviously, we just discussed that amount has declined precipitously. And the U.S. also says we're not going to take countries, people, refugees from particular countries, um, or at least we're, we're going to make it really, really hard to be a refugee from a particular country. Um, and so, uh, and then the organization works to decide, like, you, person who is a refugee, what country are you going to end up in? Yeah. Um, one of the things that you might have heard about uh, is that there are a lot of people arriving in Europe uh, who are refugees in that they beat the definition of refugee but have not been officially resettled, um, that they're just people just like, like physically taking boats um, in order to, to get to places in Southern Europe, um, and that obviously there have been a, a bunch of really tragic circumstances there. Uh, but the idea there um, is that those are people who are refugees in that they could, they do have that credible fear of persecution, um, but they have not been officially resettled, and that's that's part of the one percent problem. Is like there's a lot more people who have who classify as refugees than are than are getting legally classified as refugees. Yeah. So for a refugee, they have do they have to be in their so a refugee they have to be in their home country to apply for refugee status. No, they have status. to be in a third party country. So what that means is they've left their home country. They are oh. currently in another country, and sometimes that literally just means a refugee camp like across the border from their country. Uh, it doesn't, you know, they don't have to make it to like a very far away country, but you apply for refugee status once you have left your country. Um, and you're applying, if you're applying to like live in the United States, you'd be applying not within the United States. Um, someone who's a SILI uh, is someone who's arrived at the, uh, either in the United States or they're at our port of entry. Um, and one of the, the super sad things uh, right now, um, as you might have seen in the news this week, uh, that there are a bunch of people who are asylum seekers uh, who are physically living at U.S. ports of entry, so like living in a port, sleeping in a port in, you know, like 100 degrees southern weather, uh, because Border Patrol says that they are at capacity for processing them. So there's a bunch of people who are like, I need asylum in the United States, I have credible fear of persecution. The process is supposed to work so that those people get a hearing um, to determine if there's a credible fear and then maybe they get resettled into the United States. It's not working. Um, at least in a lot of areas right now, it's not working. So there are there are people who are physically living like in a U.S. port um, to to try and get their here. Yeah. I thought if you reach U.S. soil by sea, um, seeking asylum, you're allowed to stay at that time. Well, you have to get <laughs> sort of. Um, you have to have a hearing to demonstrate that you have a credible fear of persecution. And what Border Patrol and the uh, what the uh, immigration courts are saying is like we don't have time to process all the people who are here. They're not even getting here. So they're not getting here. Yeah. There's a there's a whole set of people who are just like haven't gotten their hearing yet, um, and that's because the government's just like, yeah, we we're at capacity. And so that's a that's an issue. Yeah. Do they apply to the UN or to different countries? 
Yep. So the people who are in the ports, like waiting for gaining asylum, how long yep. would like, what would be a time frame for how long they would have to wait for a hearing? I don't know. Um, this this just sort of became an issue very recently, um, where there are people literally living there. Uh, the courts say that they are backed up. Um, one of the things that's really troubling uh, is that some of these people don't have access to a lawyer. Um, so nationally, um, if you have access to a lawyer and have credible fear of persecution, um, your chances of getting asylum are like relatively good. It's pretty, like in, in New York, to get into a New York court, it's like above 90%. Atlanta is much worse. Sorry, Atlanta. Uh, they're, they're not doing very well with the, the asylees. Uh, but if you don't have access to um, a lawyer, it's like 1.5%. Even for people who have credible fear of persecution, they just don't have access to a lawyer to have um, to, to the uh, legal system. So, you know, uh, grow up and, and be an asylum lawyer. That would be pretty cool if, if some of you did that. Yeah. If I'm like in a third, in a, in a third party country, yep. country, and like I was applying for asylum in the US, can I also apply for asylum in other countries? So, if you're in a third party country, you'd be applying as a refugee, not an asylum. Um, uh, yeah, that's, that's just like the difference between the two is like whether you're in the United States. Um, but they would apply, you could apply for multiple countries, I think. I think the organization generally determines where you go, um, for the most part. Um, and they also sort of determine where you go once you're in the United States. Um, one of the big issues uh, is that um, there are a lot of places in the United States that might support refugees in the abstract, but like maybe don't support refugees in the concrete, like living in the small town. Um, and so that has been a, a political debate in the United States in the last few years. Um, is that you know they're uh, the sort of not in my backyard of refugee resettlement, um, where towns will say you know in the abstract maybe we should take these refugees, but like not going to my kids' school, and that's that's also pretty sad. Yeah. So you said that um, like states like New York have like, a high level of asylum rate. Yeah. Um, so do, what role do the individual states have? So that just happens to be like where the immigration court is located. They're federal courts, um, but. One, it, there's there's just sort of a situation where courts in diff different courts, so it's sort of like district courts are federal courts, but different ones have reputations for being more liberal and more conservative. In that same way, immigration courts, which are federal courts, um, what court system you end up in determines sort of what judge hears your case, uh, and that can be a big role in determining whether you can stay or not. Uh, yes? Um, like, let's say you are uh, a Syrian uh, refugee and you're yep. living in can okay. you apply for refugee status in the United States and apply and asylum status in Greece okay. at the same time? I think so. Uh, I'm I'm not totally sure. I would want to I would want to verify that. Um, I think it would probably depend on how Greece processes that, and I, I just don't know. Um, but I, I think yes. I think my guess would be yes. Yeah. Um, there's the asylum seeker like number of course, uh, uh, refugee. It is not. Um, that is evaluated on a case by case basis. Um, and is not, there is not an overall cap on the number of people who can seek asylum. Um, the idea is sort of uh, asylum is sort of the last resort, and you're already in the United States, so you get your, you get your case heard ostensibly, right? Those cases aren't being heard right now necessarily. But the, the system is set up. If the system is functionally the way it was set up, is that asylum is sort of the last resort, you're already in the United States, so that does get heard on a case by case. Yes, and then yes. Uh, do do, or do um, refugees come to the annual census in the United States? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I think once they have LPR, yeah, I, I think they get are in the census. I'm not totally sure like what, if they're in a separate category, um, but I, I, I think yes. But I'm not 100%. Yeah. So, almost, you know, uh, they're not government lawyers, but there are organizations that provide lawyers. Um, obviously, if you were to have access to money, that would make it a lot easier because um, you could just hire your own lawyer. Um, but there are organizations that provide lawyers to, um, like pro bono lawyers, to people who are seeking asylum. Good question. Kate, do you have a question? Uh, no. Okay. All right. Uh, last category uh, is immigration policy under Trump. And what I wanted to do here uh, is just sort of review the status of a bunch of things that you might have heard about in the news uh, and sort of just like get you up to date on campaign promises as well as just sort of where some things have landed. So overall numbers or overall policy, uh, Trump's stated immigration policy 
is that in addition to deporting undocumented immigrants and building the wall, he would also like to cut legal immigration. So there was initially sort of a discussion um, where people weren't sure whether Trump's claims about immigration apply to legal immigration in addition to illegal immigration. A lot of times uh, when he's talking about these issues, he sort of mushes them all together. Um, so he does talk about like need to get in line, which is a phrase people use to say like don't allow undocumented workers, but legal immigration is okay. But it has become clear over time that he also wants to cut legal immigration um, in addition to undoc deporting undocumented immigrants. Um, this is a departure from the historic stance of the GOP. So um, previous generations of Republicans generally liked uh, legal immigration. Why do you think that they would like legal immigration uh, in the abstract? Yeah, here. For, to boost the economy. Yeah, to boost the economy. So um, if you are like historically, Republicans were generally pro legal immigration because they wanted workers for businesses. Immigration helps businesses. They had then more workers. They could grow their businesses. They had more people to buy their goods. Immigration benefit economy. GOP was generally for it. Uh, why were some Democrats historically against legal immigration? What's the what's the alignment there that, that put them on the other side of it? Yeah. Human mm, it wasn't a human rights issue. I well tangentially, but probably not. Yeah. Was it just exploited like in terms of form getting paid. Uh, no. I mean, uh, it, it's, it's related to that. Yeah. Unions. 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 Yeah, for sure. Um, uh, historically, the unions tended to be more democratic, uh, and unions are sometimes against uh, immigration because they, uh, well, they might provide more workers for the union. Uh, they also might displace union workers, and so uh, sometimes people would hire immigrants instead of union workers become non-union shops because they had people outside of the union to hire. Um, that has changed pretty dramatically in the last few years. So even as of the early 2010s, there was a big GOP push uh, for comprehensive immigration reform, which meant fixing undocumented workers in the United States, maybe giving them even a path to citizenship, uh, increasing legal immigration, making the process smoother, making it less bureaucratic. Um, in the last few years, that has shifted pretty dramatically, such that under the Trump administration, uh, we're really talking that the GOP has sort of realigned to be anti-immigration. And so that when we started at the very beginning of this talk with this is a wedge issue, um, this has become a partisan issue in a different way than it was partisan in the past. Okay. Or a 
traditional family-sponsored immigration would use is family-sponsored immigration or family reunification-based immigration. So that's just two really different perspectives and ways, like the term right there, gives you two different views um, of what is happening here, right? Uh, when you talk about family reunification, that sounds a lot more positive than chain migration. And so that's, that's, a, that's a politically based term, uh, but that's what that term means. And so Trump is very much against that. Um, if his proposal were to be enacted, um, it would cut the number of legal immigrants by about 44% per year. So it's a, it would be a really dramatic cut. That's, it's not passed. It probably would not. Maybe it would. I don't know. But um, that's, that's what he wants. And in particular, according to uh, Cato, 57% of legal immigrants since 1965 would not have been admitted under the new system. So 65% of the people who have legally immigrated to the United States, uh, sorry, 57% of the people who have legally immigrated to the United States since 1965 would not have been admitted under the system that Trump would like to uh, enact. Next thing to talk about is DACA. DACA. What is DACA stand for? D-A-C-A. What do you got? Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Beautiful. Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, DACA, which is a 2012 Obama policy that prevented deportation of people who came to the U.S. as kids and gave them access to work authorization. So it said, if you came to the United States as a kid, if your parents brought you here, we are going to defer action. And what that means is that it was prosecutorial uh, jurisdiction to sort of determine who they were going to take and who they were going to be concerned about. And this said, uh, you get a two-year status um, where you can, and a two-year renewable status, where if you are living in the United States, you were brought here as a kid, we're not going to deport you. It did not give them citizenship. It did not give them LPR status. It's prosecutorial discretion to say we're just not going to deport you. Okay, so no path to citizenship, at least under DACA. Dream changes some of that. Jeff Sessions announced in September 2017 that he was canceling the program. The first people uh, this spring then were unable to renew because their, their renewal status came up. And so now it's up to Congress to sort of decide what we're going to do with this group of people that we had said you get to stay. Now Sessions and Trump say you don't get to stay. What happens to them? There's a GOP bill being debated right now, like, like literally right now, not this morning maybe, but like this week, this month, um, that would tie the legal status for DACA participants to border wall funding. So it says, like, we're going to quit pro quo here. Uh, we will, we, the GOP, will support not deporting DACA recipients, giving them uh, permanent or more permanent DACA status, giving them more permanent deferred action in exchange for funding a border wall. Now, one of the things that's sort of strange, or sad, I guess, um, about the DACA program is that there aren't that many people who, like, actually oppose it, um, but it is a political wedge issue. Um, and so, uh, you know, when surveyed, overwhelming, overwhelming majorities of American people think that we should not deport people who came here as kids, who have now graduated high school, they like probably maybe went to college, they maybe have joined the military, they are, you know, they did not choose to come here as undocumented uh, people. They did not choose to come here in an undocumented fashion or in an illegal fashion. They were kids, right? Um, and so most American citizens, when asked this question, like, obviously we should not punish people who had our choice in the matter. If you were a baby, you did not choose to do anything. Um, we shouldn't punish those people. But, but because of the way American politics is aligned right now, that has become a political issue in a way that it was not for. Yeah? Uh, if a doctor is being it's a crime, they still be like the court. Yeah. Uh, so that's being debated right now, um, and uh, there's sort of a question about what's going to happen to those people. Next category is, oh, sorry, yeah.
deporting people who had no criminal background, who had a job, who were living here and had family here, etc. That has changed, um, and now deportations are including people with no criminal history. Um, but yes, I mean, just like you know, punishment is proportional. There are some crimes that lead to deportation automatically, and there are some that don't. And that a lot of that depends on your status at the time, and honestly, who's enforcing the law. Yes, and then. Uh, could the debate on DACA theoretically be topical, even though it's sort of not really yeah. Really yeah, I think uh, the debate on DACA uh, could be topical, but there's there's a debate to be had there. It sort of depends on what you're doing with DACA. So extending the DACA program, maybe not. Uh, giving those people legal status, maybe that is legal immigration at that point, because they are going from being you know non-immigrants uh, to being a part of the legal immigration system. Maybe, maybe that's me. That's that's a good debate. Uh, under DACA, yep. how does a kid who is looking for this deferred action uh, receive it without putting like their family or at risk to the people? Yeah, so it? one of the things that uh, is really unfortunate uh, is, and, and uh, I'll go so far as to say like kind of tragic, um, is that under the Obama administration when DACA was created, the idea is like you identify yourself and you get deferred access, you know, you're, you're getting deferred action, you get to stay. Um, one of the things that's super scary for people right now um, is they have to sort of decide, like, should I try to uh, renew my status? Uh, we're not accepting new people. What is the status of this program? Is it going to get renewed by Congress? Should I continue to identify themselves? And the thing that's scary is that um, they, the government, in creating this program to protect people, also created a database of where a lot of people who came to the United States as kids live, where they work, who they are, et cetera. So a lot of people affirmatively identified themselves with the idea that they would then receive a protected status um, that are now uh, not guaranteed that status. Uh, and they had chosen to reveal themselves sort of under the understanding that they would be protected and now they're not. So um, that is, uh, you know, if you're someone who uh, is a DACA recipient or uh, you know, knows someone who's a DACA recipient, that's, that's super, super scary. Yeah. Yep. Were the parents of DACA children protected while the children were still minors? Uh, well, they were minors, ostensibly, yes, not necessarily. But yeah. Okay, the wall. The wall. Uh, if you watched any debates uh, during the 2016 election cycle, you heard a lot about a wall. There was going to be a wall. It was going to be big. It was going to be beautiful. You were going to be able to see it from miles away. A giant wall, 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 wall. Okay, uh, there is not. Has, a wall has not been built. Surprise. Um, the question then became, like, is it a physical wall? So initially it was described as like an actual wall, rather than what you would think of as a wall, a wall, okay? Um, later it was described as like maybe not an actual wall, maybe it's just like more border security, more funding for border security, which like I don't know why that's a wall, but you know, allows people to save face and say they built a wall um, without actually building a wall, which is probably politically, or which is probably infeasible for logistical reasons. Um, maybe the wall is like more of like an electronic monitoring system. I don't know why that's a wall, but same idea. Um, but there is a new GOP bill to fund it. Um, sometimes this is just classified as border security funding. We talked about this a minute ago, um, that they're debating whether to increase a bunch of border security funding in exchange for uh, fixing the DACA program or extending the DACA program. Uh, and that is, that is being made. <coughs> Deportations, I mentioned uh, that there's been a shift to deporting people even with jobs and families and no criminal history. The main story on this right now, uh, that I'm sure you have heard about, it would be almost impossible to miss, uh, is the issue of splitting up families as they cross the border, including minor children, uh, where minor children, including babies, um, are being taken from their parents. Um, if you are someone who is anti-immigration, uh, you might say that this is necessary to deter people from crossing the border illegally, that the only way to deter people is to make them really believe that their kids are going to be taken away from them, which would be enough of a deterrent to come to the United States. Um, obviously, this is highly controversial. Um, there are discussions of building in Texas, like what there is being referred to as a baby jail, which is literally like a place, a, a legal facility, protected facility, uh, jail, for uh, infants and small children who are being taken from their families. Uh, one of the things that I saw this morning that is just like terrible uh, is that uh, the people, the detention facilities uh, did not get a lot of 
advance notice that they were going to be starting to separate families. Uh, and so, as you might imagine, these detention facilities are like not really built for small kids, and there are not really people to take care of the small kids, right? Like previously in detention facilities, if you were in immigration detention and you had a baby, your baby stayed with you in immigration detention, and so the like parents or family members of that baby were taking care of the baby. Now we are literally in a situation where there are all these small kids being separated from their parents, and there's not like a school for them to go to. There's not like awesome daycare facilities. Like none of this infrastructure exists. So this is a very much an evolving and ongoing issue. Um, certainly, you know, probably somewhere on the front page of New York Times or Washington Post today or something about this. Um, it is uh, pretty horrendous uh, what is happening to uh, kids. Uh, and so it's a sort of a question of how this is going to evolve. But that's that's the issue there. Uh, and then finally, the travel ban. The travel ban um, is the Trump executive order. 2017, early 2017, January, one of his first executive orders, limiting travel and immigration from seven majority Muslim countries. There's been a big debate about whether it's a ban or a travel pause. Uh, there's a debate about whether uh, it is based on religion or not. That's what the legal battle is about. Um, is, is this based on religion or is this based on um, you know, uh, security concerns? And the real legal debate is, does the president have open authority to, based on uh, his uh, ability to set national, national security policies, does he have the ultimate authority to decide which people get to come into the United States? And that is the final ruling is going to come from the Supreme Court any day now. Um, that is, you know, being openly discussed and is a is a sort of question mark leading into uh, the topic. But um, the Supreme Court did allow the travel ban to go into effect, um, or at least parts of the travel ban to go into effect last December. Um, and so the question is just now, like, is this going to be a permanent thing? Does the president have the ability to? Thank you. 